Let me say a prayer, Father. Thank you for your presence with us here now and uh, that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. We open our hearts. We open our, uh, our eyes. We open our ears to listen uh, as those who are being taught by God. Lord, we thank you for this day. We commit it to you. And we pray that there will be uh, just life-changing elements that enter into our experience now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, just to help us refocus again, uh, one of the things that we are asking you to help us with as we're thinking about uh, creating uh, an, a book to kind of explain why the relationships and uh, uh, especially uh, sustainable relationships matter is to figure out whether the, the seven points that we're talking about here actually make sense. And part of it is if you're trying to explain to someone what you are hearing here today, would, would these seven points make a difference to you? So a little later on, we'll be asking you for your reflections on that. But let's just review them again. The first one is, um, coming up here, do you want me? So we think that's the, as attachment goes, if we have a, uh, if both the word uh, for love in the Old Testament and the love, word for love in the New Testament mean attachment, then what it means to be saved is that we should love the Lord our God. We should attach to the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, and we should attach to his people uh, so that we, uh, we have an attachment that's going to be enduring for all time. And if that's the plan of how, uh, they talk about salvation, we'll talk about a little bit this afternoon, but if transformation is actually what salvation is about, from the point of the view of the, view of the human brain, we get changed by who we're attached to, not very much by what we believe. And so the first question that, our, that a baby is uh, asking even before they're born, because I've seen so much prayer ministry to people who were born and they knew their parents didn't want them. The damage that that causes starts before you're even born because your heart is born looking for, do you want me? And then if you think of the second one, which is, will you keep me? I can think about every uh, time that someone's dealt with the issues around adoption or, or separation or, you know, or the parents that, you know, got rid of them one way or another. Um, Kitty's issue being sent off to boarding school was that her little five-year-old heart interpreted that as they don't want to keep me. And so living in a world where someone doesn't want to keep you, and if you think of everybody whose spouse has cheated on them and run off with someone else, it's like, well, you didn't want to keep me, you wanted somebody else. So uh, these become very important. The third thing is, uh, will I be special to you? Uh, it's very sad to me that most of the work I ever did as a counselor in the pretty much 30 some 30 to 40 years I was doing that, uh, it, it was either as a, a result of some kind of direct trauma or sin, a lot of it was World War II uh, and the effect it had on, on families, but <clears throat> most of the people that came in to see me were the children of Christian parents, often the children of Christian leaders. And the way I would describe it is, They'd been raised like prize-winning cows. They had been uh, fed the right things. They'd been given all their shots on time. They'd been taken to the right school. Everything needed to make them get the, you know, all the right ingredients, but no one bothered to enjoy them. And very often, when I came and spent the time to discover who they wa were and just enjoy who they created to be, this was, I mean, there's a lot of Kleenex in the world been used on that particular theme because all they wanted was somebody that was really going to think they were special and enjoy them. And on the flip side, you can't imagine how much cosmetics and other kinds of things are sold and clothes and everything else just so that someone will think I'm special and I've got to put it on on the outside. And, and we just gone down the list, you know, we'd pretty much eliminate advertising and everything it does if, if people weren't asking this, do you think I'm special? 
So then we move to the fourth item, which is how long will we stay special? Will we stay special if something goes wrong? Like if I get sad, will you still want me? If I get angry, will you still want me? Or the flip side around it, if I get angry, will I still want you? Do I remember when I'm angry how special you are? So one of the things my grandfather on one side, both of my grandfathers were rapists, so one of the, one of the rapists I knew and the other one I didn't, but uh, the, the one I did know was very well known for his rages as my father's father and he spent his entire life trying to keep that rage and anger from coming down to his children that had come into him. And so he did a very effective job of that actually. He, he wouldn't get angry for anything, but the price of that was he was not emotionally available about anything. So uh, eventually I realized that his distance was almost like he's standing between me and this bomb inside himself. That if he gets too close to anybody, it'll go off. And he doesn't want to have his kids, you know, have, subject to the same explosion he was under. Well, of course, that trained me absolutely nothing about how to be angry and relational at the same time, right? So all I understood about being angry is that the best you can do is separate yourself entirely. So the first time that I got angry at Kitty, when we got married, we were living in uh, Wentz trailer out there and outside of Bemidji, Minnesota. I remember I was angry and what I do when I'm angry is I go to my room. So then I thought to myself, uh, well, she's in the same room. So that isn't going to work. So, and I always get sent to my room until I behaved myself. And so I'm thinking, uh, yeah, I can't go there because she goes in there too. So I turned around to go outside and she says, well, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going outside. And um, when are you going to come back? And I, the answer that went into my head is when I can behave myself, but it didn't seem like the right thing to tell your wife. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I'm already trying to do that same thing. I'm trying to keep the damage from going on, on to another generation, except I never was damaged. The bomb never went off on me. My dad never lost it. He was never angry once uh, with us. He's just not there, no distant. He just didn't engage, you know. So although I hadn't had the damage in my generation, it had been there in the previous generation, my generation had no idea what to do with this. How do we relationally connect? So it was nice that I didn't damage anybody and I didn't want to go off on you, but now what do you do? I have no idea. So I said, well, uh, I'm, I'm just going out till I can come back. And she said, well, when will that be? And I had no idea because sometimes I would be sent to my room, it'd be till supper time. I got basically till I got so hungry that I had to come out and fake uh, getting along with everybody. Uh, you know, and you know, are you ready to be nice? <laughs> Why? Well, I'm hungry. But that's, you know, so, but that didn't play very well with her. She, this wasn't her image of marriage and how it worked was to have your husband stamp out of the house angry every once in a while and come back whenever he was going to come back. See, it, it was not producing joy to be together, right? There were, were pr protecting from damage that I hadn't even suffered. Very, very, you know, but you begin to look at these patterns, they don't make a whole lot of sense until we realize that human beings are actually supposed to be helpful to each other during that time. Well, all of that to move the needle up to um, our son uh, was preparing to get married and the wedding was coming up in about a month when he walked uh, in to tell us <clears throat> that he and his wife had actually gotten married a year before and they hadn't told us. <laughs> but he thought this would be very nice. He'd like to have a public wedding and all that sort of stuff. Well, I tell you what, I saw Kitty start to cry and I went to livid. Now here's the, th the reason I'm telling you all of this story. My son having no damage, you know, we're two generations down from where the damage of anger came. He walked right up to me, so he's like 10 inches from my face. He said, wow, Dad, I've never seen you so angry. Look at that, the, the veins are popping on the side of your head. And, ooh, boy, you're, you're, you look so, wow, you look really, really bad. 
Wow, I've never seen that before. In the youth group, they used to tell us that parents get this way. I never got a chance to see one before that. Wow, is this, you know, and he just went on describing the whole event. And I'm thinking, shouldn't you just melt and drop dead right now or something like that? Because I'd never had anyone describe my face when I was angry. And I said, yeah, that's exactly how mad I am. And Whoa, so my veins are popping. So I'm getting curious in this too. You see, we're interacting with each other. We're getting to know each other. It's like in the middle of being angry, the angriest I'd ever been, the first time he'd ever seen me, he found it fascinating. <laughs> There's no reason to not be relational about this. I've talked with Dad about everything that happens right now. This is fascinating, totally. Like, huh. And then he observed, you know, I've never really gotten much practice with this because you never got mad much, so I'm not so good at it myself. So I'm really looking forward to see how this turns out. I'm going, uh, this is not the way... <laughs> Can you see where this doesn't exactly resonate with what my brain has been taught to do? There's, there's no pathways here. Even at the time I'm going, you know what, I think there's something better about this than anything I've known about. There's something about this that I, and at some point I said to him, yeah, you know, I'm just furious at you. I've never been this mad before. Do I need to turn it down at all? I mean, do we need to catch our breath here? Because I don't want to interrupt this relational moment we're having. Do I need to back off? He says, no, 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 this is really interesting. <laughs> so, you know, this is what's actually inside the human mind. If there's been no damage, we'd be curious about each other. We'd want to know what's going on that's so intense and important to you. Uh, and, and how are we going to handle this together and let's talk with each other about it. Um, and I, if I hadn't have been there, I don't think I would have believed it could happen. But being there, I'm learning at, as I'm going along in the middle of this experience that there is a way to be relational, there is a way to be fascinated with someone, even if they're really mad and, and, I hadn't, and I don't think before or since I've ever been that mad. This really does, you know, this, this is the top of, have you ever seen me that mad before or since? No. So this, is, this is the Ever, Mount Everest of mad in, in my system. And it, even at that moment, it was learning. At that very moment of being there, I was learning how to relate to other people in the middle of this. Because like you said, I had no practice at all. Now the, the good part is there were no injuries. See, my dad never, never did that. So. There were no injuries, the, the learning pathway was open. And this is what we actually need to do because it often happens when there are two. Now we're on the other side of it, right? Uh, we are listening to them lose it. And the question is, are we still interested? Are we curious? Do we want to know what's going on in their little mind? Or all have we been taught to do is punish and suppress that. Because then if there's trauma in our line, we'll reenact that trauma typically or we'll withdraw and not engage until they know how to be nice. Mm. See, this is what's being interrupted. Every one of these emotions, and let's have a look at them, uh, start with shame would be the first one, has to be learned independently in your brain. So when you're feeling ashamed, uh, do you find people curious and interested in you? Or when you're f they're feeling ashamed, are you interested in them? You want to know what's going on, what's, you know, how are, now that we can see, these are all alarms in your brain. These are all alarm systems that say something is going wrong right now that, that's not good for a, a sustainable relationship. And when the alarm goes off, we say, oh, this would be a good time to fix that. So if you're not glad to be with me, can you explain why? Uh, can you show me, and, and a good shame message, which uh, will talk a little bit about, but not a whole lot. A good shame message versus toxic shame, which is what we need to think about in just a moment here. A good shame message says, we do not do this. Instead, we do this. And the shame resolves as fast as that sentence runs through you. So it lasts a lot less than the 90 seconds needed to resolve it all by yourself. It's, you know, you know, we, we do not hit our little brothers. You know, we treat them kindly and we help them to find words for what they're going to say. Oh, okay. Well, it's not like I'm going to learn that on one trial any more than I'll learn anything else on one time through. 
But if every time I do something that makes people not glad to be with me, like I'm not going to be glad to be with you if you're doing that. Here's why I'm going to be glad to be with you. Please do it this way. Let me show you. This is the way our people do it. See, it, it's a people. It's an example that we're, it's not just a model. It's, a, it's my people's example of how we handle this. And so if my people talk about what we're seeing and what's going wrong with it, and that's actually what my son had learned, right? He'd never been around anger before like this. But what he learned is that my people talk about this stuff and we observe how interesting it is and what's going on with the other person. So why wouldn't you do that in this very unique kind of situation, you know? I mean, for him it's like seeing Niagara Falls for the first time. Only in this time it's dad that's, you know, going over the edge. So, um, if, that, if this, we have this way of relating to each other, then we can learn who we are under these conditions. And then as Kitty pointed out, now I know how to act like myself. See, human beings are the weird creature on the planet, the only one capable of not acting like themselves. And the problem with sin is that every time we do something, we know we did it, so our brain goes, that must be you. But if it's a malfunction, it wasn't what we were created for, we get this idea that who I really am are all these things that are not working. Because we've never seen what it would look like to be a person that would actually be relational to God and other people. And these are the things that go wrong. So when someone isn't glad to be with me uh, because of what I'm doing, will they still share my shame and say, you know, uh, even though I'm not glad to be with you right now, I don't still want you to be alone. In my not glad to be with you, I want you to learn who you really are. We're going to teach you how my people do this so that in time you won't, you won't do this, you won't, won't malfunction again. And as we're thinking about narcissism, and I guess it was on the brochure or something having to do with being here, right? Some of you are okay. okay. Narcissism, one of the necessary ingredients is that the person involved does not know how to use shame relationally to improve relationships. So if you tell them there's anything wrong with them, instead of their responding like, oh, that, that makes me very interesting. Tell me what's wrong with me. How do my people actually do this? What have I missed? What, what, you know, why am I not getting, why are my people not glad to be with me? You handle it in a non-relational way. You manage it. You try to get the results you want, which the, the number one result is, I want to make sure you don't say that again. Right? And so the best way to say, well, there's nothing wrong with me, it's you. Uh, you've actually got the bad attitude. You're the one who's actually, you know, you came in here, you say I'm kind of critical. No, you're critical. You just criticized me. And uh, I'm going to make sure that, you know, you, get up, you leave here so miserable you won't try that one again. Mm -hmm. uh, that's toxic shame. Toxic shame says there's something wrong with you and the way you just did things. But we do not tell you how we would restore a good relationship by being ourselves. And now you're in a position that's very, very painful because shame is the opposite of joy. It's the opposite of glad to be with you. It's the opposite of, of you belong here and I want you and I want to keep you. It's like, no, if you're going to be like that, I don't want you. I'm not going to keep you. You're not going to belong here. All of these things, every one of these questions is now being answered in a painful way. Yeah. No, I don't want you right now. If you don't do what I want you to do, I don't want you. It's, room's not, town's not big enough for the two of us, right? One of the two of us is out of here and it's you. This is, again, a non-relational solution. So the problem with, with narcissism is they live in constant enemy mode, a non-relational solution is when instead of thinking you as the person I really want to have a good relationship with and is going to help me be myself, I'm on this and on my own and what you're doing to me is like an enemy. I've got to control you, manage you, make you, uh, you know, you're not on my side. And so shame is, that's the key ingredient. If I can tell you what's wrong with you and you go, wow, that's very interesting, let me find out because you know, you obviously don't have joy to be with me right now, and we want to have a joyful relationship, so how do we restore that? If you can take the message that way, but here's the 
here's the thing if you don't know how you don't realize it can be done remember what I said we don't recognize the solution we don't understand if we don't understand it it never occurs to us that there would be a way to use this moment relationally just like if most of you have had non-relational moments with anger and I said to you early on you know anger can be used to improve your relationship if your brain has never heard or seen that done you would say to yourselves you know I see your lips moving I understand the words but you're making no sense at all but I've just told you the story about being at my angriest and most of your brains followed that and although you think a blessed miracle <laughs> you actually still could picture it once and if you had that regularly, your brain would begin to go, well, it's not just a blessed miracle. This is actually learnable. Uh, if, if we had enough practice, except that I probably need some healing on all the times that anger has, has killed me in the past before I could learn. See, your brain is traumatized. It doesn't want to learn. It just wants out of there, right? So as a healing community, you want to say, let's remove the blockages but as a growing and maturing community we want to say and let's learn how to do this relationally this is what a community has to be able to do with narcissism and shame <coughs> so the next one then hopeless despair we've talked about a good deal move on down through the list here quickly discussed um, I'm not going to elaborate these we'll just keep going fear anger sadness attachment pain and of course no group exercise this time so let's go on to the next slide so now we've realized in order to have good relationships we have to want to be together but the key result is whether or not we will get back to joy from the things that go wrong from the alarms that your body has that says something is going wrong in this relationship that needs to be restored if your brain goes overnight in one of these unpleasant states like there's no joy here it will pump cortisol through your your system your body will say <clears throat> let's run that stress hormone through which is basically uh, um, will kill any new growth in your brain so whatever you tried to grow that day whatever you tried to learn that day your brain says forget that the day ended without joy so let's try to erase as much of this part of our our experience so we don't do that kind of a thing a day again so now think about this in terms of falling in love um, you fall in love you're building joy someone's glad to be with you all these things happen and then you hit one of those seven pains and your partner now does not know how to do that relationally what will your brain do that night it's going to run cortisol so let's erase whatever is going on what's going on well up until now I've been pretty attracted to this person I thought they're pretty sweet I thought they're pretty nice not so sure so there's really nothing in your brain that makes you fall out of love except not being able to hold deal with these seven pains relationally if all of those things brought you back to with the person I mean, just think about it this way have you, you ever either been in a hospital or visited someone in the hospital and there were a lot of pain and about all they could do is look at you and you saw in their eyes they're really glad that you're there with them there's nothing happy about the moment but it's like oh you're here that's joy and it'll sustain you in all kinds of sorrows and trouble if you see that in the other person's eyes so as upset as we are and and both Kitty and I having been raised without these relational skills one of the things we discovered we could we could say to each other is you know we do not know how to resolve this tonight so we keep talking we'll be up all night and we're making no progress whatsoever we're getting very tired but do we have the kind of relationship where we wish we could work this out together and we'll look at each other and go yeah yeah right actually I wouldn't be nearly so upset if I knew we could work this out together you know feeling like you're losing an important relationship very upsetting right so if we know we, we want to work this out together we just don't know how would that be okay if we're just glad to be together and go to sleep now and maybe tomorrow we'll 
you know, we won't forget what we're fighting about. We can come back tomorrow. It's, you know. So, Lord Jesus, would you hold on to this overnight? Because, you know, we kind of need to rest and we're not very well equipped to handle this thing in life. That kind of relationship, your brain doesn't have to pump cortisol all night. In fact, you'd expect the scripture to say something like, don't let the sun, day and the sun go down on your anger. Because, actually, it'll be bad for you to run the night that way. Uh, that's the kind of thing that makes you prone to cancers and all kinds of other terrible health conditions, having cortisol levels that are too high. So if you were just to say, we have gotten back to being glad to be together, we haven't resolved the problem, but we're glad to be together and we're going to rest together, you're in a completely different state and you want to do that every night before the sun goes down. That would be really good advice. I should have that written into the Bible. So let's look at uh, where we go from here. The next thing is, will we share our people? And the, the biblical concept for that is koinonia. And that comes down to, will you care about the people I care about? So you think about a blended family. This is immediately the issue. Will you care about these people just because they care about, I care about them? Or if you think about getting married, you think about the same issue. You know, I've not brought this person in. But you think about it also in terms of churches. You know, you've come to my church, will I care about your people? Will I care about your alcoholic husband? Will I care about your, um, trying to think of the English word, I grew up in Spanish, travieso is the word that's in my head, uh, wayward son, not quite the best translation, but will I care about the things that are going wrong in your life? Will I share your pain? Do I still want you here? Will I extend my care to the people that you care about, even though they're highly annoying? In other words, Will I love the people who don't love me back just because you love them? Now, who do you suppose is asking us that question? <laughs> Will you love the people I love because I love them even though they don't love you back? They might think that they're your enemies. They might think you're one of those, you know, we think of it in church as, you know, those stupid people down in church. But will someone love them because the uh, father of all the families on earth, the one from whom they all take their name, looks at that and goes, they're my children. Uh, they won't accept it, maybe, but will you love them because I love them? That's, this becomes the question, will we share our people? And it becomes the question, the only time we really care about it is when they're unpleasant. Right? Right? Of course, we're all willing to love everybody who's got pleasant relatives and friends and bring them all down, right? Because uh, they're not hurting anybody. They're not dangerous. They're not whatever. But suppose your relative is a predator, right? Will you love the predator I'm, I'm hooked to, right? Well, the reason we don't do that in church is that we have nothing that will transform a predator. I mean, basically, we have as a culture. Now, the interesting thing is the church in other parts of the world is busy watching predators get transformed. But something in our culture says, oh, we've got a predator, uh, keep them out of church. Because if they come to, well, really, if they come to church, they're lambs every place and they're going to eat them. And that's what they'll do because we have no way of transforming a predator. So our only way to do is lock them out. But now... You're beginning to see what I see as the problem in the American church. If we can't really profoundly transform people's character, then the best thing we can do is get the people willing to be nice and put them together. And we can't go outside that. Now, understand, if we go outside that and we can't help them, then we're just feeding lambs to the wolves. But if there is a way that lions can lay down with lambs, if there is a way that leopards can stop eating the goats, if there is a way that they do not hurt or destroy in all the holy mountain, if that can be done, <clears throat> then we should be running a very different kind of operation. We should be seeing something happening here that everyone will look at and go, wow, I didn't know that could happen. Uh, and uh, so... When we talk about sharing our people, we're beginning now to distinguish a church from a cult. 
because in a cult we want you your people you're going to have to keep them out of here unless they just become one of our cult members so uh, a lot of my friends um, have their children getting married they're married to someone their their child is a member of this church or that church or the other church but after they're married they almost lose their child to that other group it's like well if you're one of those you know they're we don't care about your people. And from the brain's point of view, it's called acquired value. Do you acquire value to me because it has value to you? And if we are connected to other people, especially to the mind of God, we are acquiring, people are acquiring value to us because we see that God cares about them. And uh, that's, a, that's a very, very important distinction. So number six. Will you help me be my true self? And now um, we have reached the level of all of the major religions in the world. They will all tell you who your true self is, how you're supposed to be. And they will say, yes, uh, you and your people belong to us. You should bring them on in. And um, what is your true self? Well, Buddhism will tell you one thing. Shinto will tell you another, Hindu will tell you another, but they will all tell you this is our, our true self, this is what people do at least in this incarnation or this what circumstance. And we expect you to act that way. We're, we as a people, we're going to make sure you act that way. We're going to um, direct you into acting that way. We'll, we'll pull you back into acting that way. But, you know, this is, this is what now every major religion in the world creates a people and it creates a people that are alike in some significant way but true self now that starts to be a little bit interesting to us doesn't it and what i think we believe in the true self is if this is an everlasting family whoever it is that you will be in eternity is the true self are you that person now no, you're learning, but you don't know yet. You know, little glimpses of it here. We see darkly through a, through a mirror. You know, we got little glimpses of who we could be, but we're a long ways from getting there yet. So, uh, my, my, uh, my mother, who we found out when she was in her 70s, half of her brain, the right half of her brain was full of water. She only had half a brain. And that uh, had been that way since birth, and that explained a lot of things about her and her lack of right hemisphere relational skills and stuff like that. Though I will point out that she was a very, very effective missionary, and uh, there are somewhere in the order of 2,500 women and children's groups running in South America of people loving the Lord because of this woman with half a brain. So. First thing they have to say is, and I, by the way, I'm the son of a half a brain. So, uh, you know, God is, seems to be doing something through me. So, you know, lest we all despair mm -hmm. uh, that we've got some problems, and I assure you, you've got them, and I've got them. We've got a God who intends to get his work done through our lives, whatever he meant us to do. Whoever he meant us to be is going to leak through some way or another, even if we don't see it. Well, she did not like uh, my wife particularly well. Um, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> we got an amen out of that. We right? got an amen. Mm -hmm. And she also did not like the work that I do. Made her very uncomfortable. She never, couldn't figure out what I was doing. And she was pretty well sure that I had wandered from the faith doing what I'm teaching you about here. Because what her range of what she could understand about being Christian didn't include a lot of what I'm, I'm doing right here. This, you know, just no way of understanding that if your relational half of your brain happens to be all water. Just let's put it that way. So she would get upset at me and try to get me to stop. And I would ask myself the question. And this is the question we're looking at. Now, my mom really upset right now, and I have the choice of trying to not upset my mother, which I'd prefer not to actually, but uh, not upsetting her now, but in eternity she wouldn't thank me. 
Or will I endure the rest of her life with her upset at me and not liking me very well so that in eternity she'll turn around and say, hey, you didn't let that half of my brain that's full of water stop you from what I now value. You will not let my defects stop you from being what God was doing in your life just because I couldn't understand, didn't like it, and didn't tolerate it. This is what I mean about living uh, our true identity. Will we look at that and say, you know, as difficult as it is for me to see, I'm trying to see in you what God is growing. And I want to encourage that. And we're going to do that as a community. We're going to look at all of the people who are annoying us, bothering us, uh, not doing relationships right, uh, preaching too hard, even being thoroughly narcissistic and go, you know what, as much as it's going to bother you, I'm not going to let, we as a community, are not let you, going to let you be narcissistic. We're not going to let you be this way. And even if you spend the rest of your life mad at us for it, when you get the perspective of heaven, which you're missing right now, and I realize if I just do this by myself, I'm talking about my personal arrogance. I'm the one who sees this. But if we're doing it as a community that's listening to God, we see what does God want us to be. As a community, we cannot simply let people go on drifting without relational skills, without connecting with others, without becoming the people that God meant them to be. And it will annoy some of them. And some of them are just annoying and don't know how to stop. So the other side of it, there's a lot of people for lack of relational skills, they are messing up their lives. For lack of knowing how to connect with people, they are deep into pornography. For lack of knowing how to connect with people, they are using drugs. There's all kinds of things like that. And even stealing and doing, you know, they get into your house, they'll steal your stuff. That kind of, you know, misbehaving. Is that who they will be in eternity if they, if they learn and follow God? Well, no. Then Paul says, some of you in former times were thieves. And he goes down the list of all the stuff you, you used to think was you. Mm -hmm. And you would have been right if you just looked at what you were doing. But if you're looking at what's going to be eternal, you would say, oh, this is passing away. This is, this is the way my brain has learned to malfunction, but it's not the real me. And you need the people around you to see that before you can see it yourself. Right? So are we those people? That's what it means, will you help me be my true self? And if we continue to go back to what God is seeing, we will not abuse people. But if we impose on them what we think God ought to see in them, which is much more typical of churches, uh, you will find people constantly being squeezed into some human understanding of who somebody else should be that doesn't fit them any better than Saul's armor fit on David. We're trying to make them into our kind of person as opposed to seeing in them who God meant them to be. So number seven, will we share the same God? Uh, of course, Ruth said, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And ultimately, if we're making an enduring people, it's the people of, of this God. Um, and we were having a, a discussion um, yesterday, Kim, and you said the, one of the groups you were with started at this point, you know, this is, you know, we're all together because we, we say we have the same God. Um, but the thing about having the same God is that we usually have the same beliefs about God. That's how we get together and agree that we have the same God. But do we love the way the God, this God does, is how I'm going to suggest to us we think about getting to this point to hear. Now, we have a God now who loves his enemies and does good to those who uh, are evil and, uh, and would sacrifice for them. Are, is that the God that we're following? Because uh, Jesus said, even the heathen uh, love their neighbors as themselves. You take care of, you know, if we're getting to, trying to get to the level of loving your neighbor as yourself, you have only gotten to level six, you know, every other religion in the world. But we've got a God who says, you know, we see what, do, what isn't seen as though it were real. Though we once regarded Christ according to the physical, what we could see, we no longer think of 
him that way and we no longer think of each other that way. We see as real those things which are going to be eternal. We're always calling that out. And that means that even though you think you're my enemy, and by the way, all narcissists will think you're their enemy, at, especially when they're upset, there's nothing real about that. You are completely out of touch with reality right now and you have no idea. What I see as real is completely different than that and we see it as a community. We're a community of people who set out. See, the, the, the thing about narcissism that's most detectable is I don't have to love you if you don't love me well enough and I'll let me point out to you how you're not loving me well enough. And they, they'll point it out and actually they'll be pretty accurate. Right? Because most of us, when we've been criticized by a narcissist, we realize they had their finger on something. This is kind of true. You know, I, I, I did have a bad attitude. Right? I mean, we're, we're not perfect, so a narcissist doesn't have to look very hard to find something wrong with us. And then we're halfway honest, we'll know. Yeah, they're, they're kind of halfway right about that. But, is that the real you? Ah, it never is. So now, you're calling the real you what isn't. You're missing the real you. That's why Paul tells Titus, teach the older women not to be devils. <laughs> Diabolos, straight up translation. Teach them not to be devils. What do devils do? They accuse you of being the person who did that wrong thing. Whatever you did wrong is the real you. And God says, whatever you did wrong isn't the real you can never be the real you because Ephesians 2 10 you are God's workmanship. workmanship redeemed in Christ in order to do the good works that he prepared ahead of time that you might walk in them or do them or live them out so whenever you're the real you you will always 100% of the time be doing good works prepared ahead of the time for you that's the real you that's what's going to be eternal if you see anything else it would be a good time for a shame message and go, whoa, you've forgotten who you really are. That's a really bad expression of who you are. So let's help you find a better one. Uh, and yes, right now you think I'm your enemy because I'm pointing that out and you're feeling shame and all of that. But you know what? Shame just helps us be better friends. You haven't learned that yet, but let me tell you a few of the times that I felt shame and it helped me learn how to have a better relationship. So let me express my own shame to you very well. So and when we're in that mood, we're, we know that's going to happen. We're comfortable with that because we've learned it and practiced it as a people. Then when someone comes along and goes, oh, that's not recoverable. I don't have to love you now. I said, wow, you've totally forgotten what, who our God is. So we really need to love you right now and bring you back. Of course, part of loving you, like upsetting my mother, might be the way we're going to relate to you right now, you're not going to like till you see things the way eternity sees them. And when we're the kind of community that lives that way, now we are sharing the same God. Because we're sharing the way he sees things. We're sharing the way he relates to people. We're sharing the character he shows when we're interacting with problems and hurtful things, you see. These are the things that then lead us um, to uh, basically retraining our brain to begin to at least faintly see the world the way that God sees it. And the thing about teaching your brain is it takes a lot of repetition, right? So the idea that I can explain this to you well, I can give you the principles, I can, you know, how it's supposed to be done, has done absolutely nothing for training your brain other than now you can recognize that you blew it, but you still don't know how to do it. So we have to be the kind of community that practices this with each other. Uh, over repeated failures, we bumble along really well together uh, and we encourage each other. Uh, as Paul said, uh, you know, uh, remind those who have forgotten, encourage those who are getting discouraged, and bear or carry the weak. Uh, we tend to rebuke the weak. And actually, it wouldn't say to carry them along if they could do it on their own. That, they're the third category. The first category is the people, they could do it, but they just forgot who they were. 
Second category in, in that Thessalonians passage are the people who know it, but they, they're weak at it. They need somebody to encourage them to go, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I know it's not working very well yet. You know, we're bumbling a lot and, you know, getting more failure than success. But let's, you know, let's keep going. And then there's some people that simply can't do it without us. They're, they're the weak. Now, if people whose brain is in enemy mode so that they can't hear God and they don't know what he wants them to do and they can't even perceive themselves correctly because their brain won't let them do it. Talking narcissists. Are they the strong ones or are they the weak ones? They're the weak ones. We're going to have to carry them along until they can at least get to be in the, in the, uh, the um, people who need to be encouraged category. We're going to have to do things for them as a community brain that they can't do for themselves as individuals. And they're not the only ones. They're just the ones that we currently think of as the best examples of Christians. That's why the rate of narcissism among pastors is 3,000% above the average population. Say that again. 3,000% higher narcissism among pastors than in the general population. It, this didn't happen by chance. This happened because we look at that and go, that must be what a Christian looks like. That's the only way that we could have gotten that many in power. So we have to learn something different as a community. We need to look at it and go, are we putting people in charge that know how to love their enemies? Or are we being deceived by something that looks like it's the real thing, but it isn't? And how do we know the difference? Would you know how to tell us? Yeah. Yes. Could we tell a weed from a real plant? We could. Well, why don't you come and lead us in that direction? <laughs> And we'll have the next slide, please. <laughs> Put this on you. All right. Okay. Yes, I guess that was my cue. <laughs> so, um, Yes, so I'm going to share something that is also an enemy of sustainable relationships. And as Jim was saying, can be why we allow people that don't have the actual fruit of the Spirit into <coughs> positions that are very influential. And um, so this was in 2003. I had, we had just bought our house that we live in now. And there was this big tall plant outside the front door probably about this tall and every time I walked in the house I thought is that a weed or is that a plant is it a weed or is it a plant is it supposed to be there I don't know it was a good looking weed it looked pretty good yeah it, it wasn't one of those that you looked at that and went hey, get out get that out of there it was pretty and so um, one of those times after several times of asking that asking myself that I um, was to having a having a little nap in the living room and I had this dream and in the dream the Lord just spoke to me and said it's a weed and he said but it grows plentifully in my house because my people don't discern it from the real plant and so he proceeded to tell me what it had what were the the elements of it so this plant had three tiers of leaves and the top tier, he said, is the pride of principal living. The second was fear masquerading as wisdom. And the third, selfish selflessness. And I knew this was God because I wouldn't make those things up. Those things would not have crossed my mind. I would not make those categories up. And they just had weight. It hit me. You know, I'm like, whoa. This is, this is something I need to understand. So in explaining, um, I, I wanna go through each one of those 
because it took, I took time to really listen to the Lord, converse with him about them, because I really wanted to understand them. I knew this was a really important thing that he was saying to me. So I took about a month and journaled about it and listened for his thoughts and his words so I could get it, because I wanted to get what he wanted to show, show me. So the pride of principled living. This might not be too hard to understand. You remember the rich young ruler? He came to Jesus. Maybe I should read that, just so we remember the story of the rich young ruler. That's in Mark chapter 10. Let me see here. If I can get this to pull up. I just had it a minute ago. All right. Mark chapter 10, 17 through 22. As Jesus started on his way, a man came running up to him, kneeling down in front of him, and he cried out, Good teacher, what one thing am I required to do to gain eternal life? Jesus responded, Why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. You already know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not cheat, and honor your father and mother. The man said to Jesus, Teacher, I have carefully obeyed these laws since my youth. Jesus fixed his gaze upon the man with tender love and said to him, Yet there is still one thing in you lacking. Go and sell all that you have and give the money to the poor, and then all of your treasure will be in heaven. After you've done this, come back and walk with me. Completely shocked by Jesus' answer, he turned and walked away very sad for he was extremely rich. So this is a person who could take pride in the fact that he did A, B, C, D, E, F, G of those commandments, but Jesus knew that in his, what was in his heart. He knew that there was something else that he wouldn't do, that he absolutely, and it absolutely proved that he wouldn't do it. So the pride of principled living is about having a set of principles that you follow that become like your own version of the law, that if you keep all these things, then you feel pretty good about yourself. You feel like a good person, and you think you can keep those, and that's really just good enough. And it doesn't take into account that there's so many other things that you don't do well, but it can look really good. It can look really good. A very principled person can look really good. I remember in our earliest days in ministry, we had a guy in our first church. He was an upstanding member of the community. He sat in the front row of church and always shared encouragements and Bible verses and prayed loudly and seemed to really just be a great guy. But I always felt like there was something not quite right. I just, something didn't feel right. And years later, after we had left that area, we found that he was actually horrifically abusing his family. And it, you know, he looked really good on the outside and you know, could be counted on to do lots of things in church. He had some principles that he kept and took pride in, but there was not good fruit. There was not good fruit. Also, there's uh, an example that I think of in the scripture of somebody who was not like the rich young ruler who lived in communion with Jesus. I always love the story of Mary and how she responded to Jesus when he came and asked her, when God came and asked her if she would be the son, the bearer of his son. The father came to her, that is. And she had lived a principled life. She was a good Jewish girl. And she would not have gotten pregnant outside of marriage. She was engaged to be married, and this was going to really mess up her life big time because she would be breaking the principles. But what would have happened to all of us if she hadn't have said yes? If she hadn't lived a life of communion with God, moment by moment, that enabled her in that time, as a 14-year-old girl, to say yes, yes, and to be honored to have said yes, even though her life would be very complicated. That to me is a very different kind of fruit 
than you see with the rich young ruler. So that's the pride of principle living. Fear masquerading as wisdom means always erring on the side of caution and believing that that's wisdom. I, I've heard that saying a lot, a, a lot of times in my lifetime. People say always err on the side of caution. But I think that that's not real wisdom. Wisdom might be to take a gigantic risk. It just might be like what Mary did. I love this quote from the Chronicles of Narnia and it's Mr. Beaver talking. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mr. Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. And he's the king, I tell you. Isn't that true? He isn't safe, but he is awesome and he's good and he loves us. And we know that, that fear is the anti antithesis of love. As it says in 1 John 4.18, love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for punishment and this shows we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Really, the safest place on earth is being in the center of his will, which is being in communion with him in the center of his love. If we live in that love relationship with God, then we don't err on the side of caution all the time. We follow the lamb. We follow the lion. We follow him and what it is that he's leading us to do. Because he's leading us out of his love. There was a time when Michael, after we had left church staff, retired from church staff, had a, had a really good job with an engineering firm, traffic engineering firm. And he had worked there for about three years. And we sensed that something was changing. And we sought the Lord. And he really said very clearly to both of us that it was time for him to quit. There weren't any other opportunities in sight of what was supposed to come next. But we really were at a crossroads and we asked the Lord, is this what you're saying to us? And it was clearly confirmed to us that he should just quit. It was a risk. And he took that risk and so many blessings came out of it. But we didn't know that at the time. Had we erred on the side of caution, we would have missed the blessings that were going to come to us if we took that risk out of love for him. Now selfish selflessness, that's a little bit different and difficult to understand. Jim had just talked about your true self and I really like what he had to say about that. I feel like it was a really great description that it's who we will be in eternity. We do have a true self that was made in the image of God, that is a treasure to God. But in lots of church environments that I've been in at least, there's a sense that the self is all bad. The self is all evil and never to be trusted. And what I really felt like the Lord was giving me from this uh, revelation about selfish selflessness is that we have to have a self to be able to give it away. The less secure and aware we are of who our true self is, the, the less we can give it away fully. You do it by choice, you do it out of love, not just giving yourself indiscriminately. You're giving it when the Lord motivates you to do that. I think that's a really important part of understanding that, that hasn't been made clear in a lot of Christian circles. The obvious thing is doing, doing things to look like you're selfish. You know, you can do lots of good works that look like you're, you're selfless, I mean. And I think that that has kind of led to lots of misunderstanding about this. We have to have a self to give away. When I was a young 
20, 21-year-old, 20 20-something. I did go to the mission field for a short time. It was a summer program called Student Training and Missions. And I was of a mindset that the best thing that I could do for God would to be give my life over to him and go to the foreign mission field. I felt like that was the best thing you could do for God. So I got over there. I spent the whole summer working with Muslim people, North Africans in southern France and North Africa. And I was on my little cot at the end of that time in Algeria in a mission compound. And I said, okay, Lord, I'd like to know, is this where you are sending me? I said, if this is where you want me to be, here am I, send me. And he read me this scripture. Um, I, I don't even remember if I had the Bible open to it or if he led, it, led me to it. But have you ever had the Lord read a scripture to you where you know he's got a highlighter and he, this, is, this is him talking to you? <clears throat> he said from Isaiah 30:15. In returning and rest is your salvation, in quietness and confidence is your strength. He said, no, I'm not sending you. I was like, oh, wow, I really thought he took everyone that signed up. And that he would be, he would be delighted if I did. So it was a really big lesson to me that it was not at all about that. That that wasn't what selfless was going to be about for me. For anybody, selflessness is that we abandon ourselves to a relationship with him and then we let him lead us moment by moment, that his eyes guide us, that his heart motivates us, that what he speaks to us in our thoughts, the ways that he communicates with us out of his love are the ways that we're led by him and that's what it means to be truly selfless. When I think about that, I think about Abraham. Was Abraham not led by the voice of God to the very, you know, brink of what would have been just the hardest thing in his life, of sacrificing his son? Yet at every point, he allowed God to lead him. Very, care very carefully, he obeyed the Lord. Because he knew that God loved him and that God would provide the lamb. He knew he would provide if it was God's will for Isaac to live. I believe that's what it means to live a truly selfless life, is abandoned to that relationship with Jesus. So in developing our awareness of these things, there's a favorite scripture that I have. Hebrews 5.14. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. That's the only way you get good at anything, is to have constant practice. You win some, you lose some. You fail, and then you learn from your failures. But discernment is what it takes to be able to tell the difference between these things that look good and present as a religious facade it's like having a, a fake apple and a real, real apple. From a distance, you can look at that fake apple and it looks really good. Somebody designed that really well. But you take a bite of that and you know pretty quick that it is not real. That this thing that might have some warts and bumps on it and be a little messier than the fake apple, that that's the real fruit. And that's how we get the dis that's how we get to it, is by discernment. Okay. Okay. All right. Is it new? leading up to this whole issue of discerning narcissism in our culture, discerning it in the church world. As Jim pointed out, it's very rampant in the church culture. And um, narcissism kills, is killing the church. And 
we, we have to talk about this and we have to uh, get God's mind and heart about this problem and his solutions. So I'm going to close with an experience that I had uh, that will be good for you to chew on over lunch, uh, no pun intended. So um, this experience was a dream that I had. And it is one of the most remarkable experiences of my life. It, it happened a number of years ago, probably close to 20 years ago. And um, I've been given to spiritual dreams from time to time through my years, and this was one that stands out uh, very, very clearly. And so in this dream, uh, in the middle of the night, I, it was as though I was looking through a telescopic lens of a camera. Uh, like a like a video camera that was panning across beautiful grass it was manicured grass and I could see the individual blades because the telescopic lens was so uh, up close and it was perfectly manicured and it was like on a golf course or a, a garden of some kind and as it pans across from the left to the right right in the middle it seemed of the of the view there was this ugly weed sticking up out of the beautiful grass. So Terry had her weed dream and I had mine. They weren't too far apart from each other actually. So there's this ugly weed sticking up. And, and in my dream experience, I was like uh, really offended and, and disgusted by this weed. Uh, more than you would in the natural if you saw it. It was like this heightened disgust, like, ooh, that is horrible. That doesn't fit here. And then I heard a voice in the dream, which happens from time to time. I heard this voice say very clearly, if you tower over others in a grassroots movement, you're probably a weed. And... Um, I instantly knew that the grassroots movement was about the Jesus movement that happened in the late 60s and 70s across the world. Some of you know about that. But, but ever since that time, and it was the time in which Terry and I were both converted to Christ, was in the, what was known as the Jesus movement, we ha have known and been praying for another Jesus movement to come. And we are anticipating this grassroots Jesus movement and uh, the Lord's been talking to us about this and confirming it to us and many other people across the world as well probably some of you anticipating this this organic spread of the gospel that can't you really can't find headquarters for it and you really can't find the personality that's behind it right because it's God who's behind it and it's spreading uh, it's spreading virally. It's it's a uh, it's like a it's like a holy virus that's spreading, and people are coming to faith uh, by you know dozens. And it's it's just an amazing. It was an amazing time in history, and we think it's coming again. But the voice said, "If you tower over others in a grassroots movement, you're probably a weed." And I heard the tone of the voice, and the tone of voice was not angry. It was matter of fact. He just wanted me to know, you know, and he wanted others to know. And I knew that as I saw that dream, that this was a message he was going to give me to convey. And he was going to call me to convey it to leaders in the church world. And so this was something that was very, very clear. So then the, the vision repeated in the dream. So the second scene was just like the first. So I'm back at the beginning, panning across the beautiful green grass, and lo and behold, get to the middle, and there's the weed again. But this time the voice said, if you want to tower over others in a grassroots movement, you're probably a weed. And I felt the weight of how that, that uh, evaluation, it was like a grid for evaluating what was going on in my heart as I was experiencing it you know oh I don't want to tower over others but do you want to tower over others it was going deeper into the motivations and intentions of the heart and then it happened a third time and it was almost you know humorous by this point the same scene and come to the middle and there's that weed and the voice said it this way on the third time if you want others to think you tower over others in a grassroots movement you're probably a weed 
And I woke up out of this dream in the middle of the night, snapped awake, and the presence of the Lord was very strong upon me and in the room, and I felt enveloped by heaven. It's the only way I can describe it. And um, the, the, the amazing thing was that this dream was very brief. It was very, very vibrant and clear. And for the next three days, I lived in that awareness that I was being enveloped by heaven. And it was almost like I was floating through my life in the next three days because I was so caught up in the awareness of God's conscious presence. And what he was saying to me was, Michael, this dream is not just a pizza dream. This dream is not just something of your imagination. This is a dream that I've given you, and, and my presence is the confirmation to you of how important this is. And, and I want you to convey this at the right time to the body of Christ and to leaders in the body of Christ. And so uh, I think that this, uh, we'll, we'll ponder this at lunch, and, uh, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk more about the problem of narcissism in, uh, in Christendom and in our culture. So. Mm -hmm.